Now, meeting-wise, if you recall uh, back over the year, uh, I arranged with the Rotary Club and we had uh, Harrison Schmidt, uh, the Apollo 17 astronaut, down here, and uh, most of our members actually got to see him uh, at the uh, dinner at the Mornington Racing Club back in July, so that was, uh, that was quite a coup. Uh, we've continued on with uh, the meetings that uh, the formats that we've had in previous years, parallel sessions and so forth, videos and that, and that will continue on tonight. We've also continued videotaping the meetings, and that's why the video camera's over on that side. And the videotapes are available in the library to borrow as well of any past meetings where we have actually had the video camera here. So if you miss it, then you can catch up. Uh, main talks given this year will be uh, Chris Luke tonight, uh, Peter Lowe, Russell Thompson, obviously uh, Dr. Harrison Schmidt, the astronaut, uh, Marty Rudd and uh, Roger Vodica earlier in the year, uh, Perry Vlahos from the ASV, uh, myself and uh, Ian Sullivan as well. So we've had a, a fair mixture of a number of external examples. Uh, the library continues to move from strength to strength. About two uh, librarians, Andrew Thornton and uh, Jane McConnell, putting a, a lot of uh, time into the library. And uh, that's helped moving forward uh, quite considerably. Raffles have been continued on by uh, David Gurley as well. Newsletter continues on in the good hands of our editor, uh, Richard Pollard. And that's something that someone who works night shift uh, can do. Social uh, activities. Uh, members, uh, some members went to NASA in Western Australia during the year. Uh, the first Friday of every month is uh, not only a public night, but these days tends to be quite a social night given the number of members that actually turn up with their telescopes mm -hmm. today, so uh, that's uh, quite a development. South Australia, Peter. South Australia, sorry, yes, quite right. Um, members' nights at the Briars have continued, and we've had at least four of those uh, every month. There was one social dinner at, the, uh, at Frankston, there was a solar day, uh, hosted by uh, Ian Sullivan at the Prize, which was very successful. Uh, visit by buses up to IMAX to see Space Station 3D, which uh, Sally organised uh, admirably. Uh, monthly working bees and free barbecues continue throughout the year, and the Christmas breakup is actually coming up for society. Main phenomena during 2002, well, several uh, aurorae were seen and uh, photographed. Uh, there were a couple of lunar grazing expeditions to Merricks and Bayswater, uh, which is continuing our close links with other societies, uh, particularly the uh, ASV. And of course, the preparations for the total solar eclipse in uh, Sejuni are uh, coming up uh, imminently. Well, that's uh, my president's uh, report. Treasurer's report. Uh, I see our treasurer couldn't actually make it tonight, so we don't have a treasurer's report. So what I shall do in this uh, unusual case, it's a, a night of unusual happenings, is that uh, I'll defer the, uh, the review and acceptance of the treasurer's report until the January general meeting. And that will be the first half of the business of that uh, meeting. Uh, right, we're on to the election now of uh, the 2003 committee. Uh, number 13 on uh, up there. Those of you who are financial members have been given a voting form to, uh, to put your references <coughs> on. Number them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, please. Uh, the procedure that will be used uh, for determining the number of ordinary members is that uh, all the ones will be added up, and whoever gets the most is uh, selected into one of the five positions. Whoever gets the next most number of ones uh, will be the next person, and so forth. If there ends up being a draw for the, uh, the fifth uh, available position, then uh, we'll uh, add up the number twos. And if that's a draw, we'll go to the number threes. If that's a draw, we'll go to the number fours and so forth. Are there any objections to the voting procedure by any of the candidates here tonight? I do object. No objections to the voting procedure. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. That's the first time society's had to do this. Right. Well, without further ado, I declare all the uh, committee uh, positions vacant. Uh, the Committee of the Year has been uh, David Gerling, who's holding the bucket, uh, going up and down, uh, <laughs> up and down there, because our public officer is not here tonight, he should be doing that. Uh, David's been <coughs> Vice President of the Society this year. He's uh, organised and uh, virtually single-handedly whipped together the four telescope learning days throughout the year, and uh, members' nights, uh, not to mention the Ken Bryan Scope Day as well. He liaises with the Briars and runs the raffle, and he'll be running around with a smaller bucket with that uh, a little bit later. Uh, Sally Zesser down the front here uh, is uh, Society's uh, Secretary for 2002. She also uh, staples and uh, posts very, very quickly the Scorpius, the uh, new 
newsletter that comes out every two months so that you get that on the phone. She also liaises with the Peninsula School, um, arranges uh, for some of the social events through a social subcommittee, such as the IMAX visit. Marty Brave, who's not here tonight, he's probably sleeping after the Leonids, uh, is the treasurer this uh, year, and he also liaises with the uh, Eastern Australia Meteor Network. John Cleverton down uh, the front here, who will put his hand in the air so you, you, uh, you know. He's responsible for putting the regular items in the local newspapers, together with uh, our public officer, uh, Russell Thompson, who's not here. Uh, he's also, John's also the webmaster and uh, one of the moderators of uh, eScorpius, uh, mailing group. He also prepares the little What's On handouts, which are sitting over there. If you didn't pick one up, uh, they'll be back there at, uh, <coughs> at uh, tea break. And he also prepares the name tags as well. Uh, Ian Sullivan, who's uh, down the front sitting uh, next to him with his uh, hand in the air, he does his regular segment. He prepares the annual calendar for the society, and you'll uh, get a copy of that in your next uh, newsletter. He uh, also uh, arranges uh, various bits and pieces with uh, videos, copying them and labeling them. He ran the Solar Day and also uh, the basic astronomy class this year, which will continue on next year. Uh, John Leggett, who I think is in here, yes, in, uh, in yellow, has uh, been on the uh, committee as well, as an ordinary member this year. He uh, organises uh, school viewing nights and liaises with uh, the school following them up and afterwards. He's also an occasional school and public speaker, I know, which uh, I'll, I'll take great interest in next year as well. He liaises with the Briars and also um, does uh, the uh, typically the supper at the public nights. Yeah, okay, Dave's now going away to add up all the, uh, all, all the ballots and uh, he represents the little hotel now. Uh, Russell uh, Thompson, who uh, I said uh, earlier is on his night, he's the public officer and he also gave a couple of talks during the year on uh, the University of the Nutshell. And uh, last but not least is uh, Jane McConnell at the, the front here, uh, who uh, is also an ordinary member of the committee this year. She copies the Scorpius, standing for hours and hours and hours at the photocopy of doing it. And uh, she also assists with uh, social gatherings, so uh, without, without her you can get the Scorpius at all. Right, plug for new committee members. Uh, well, those of you who are on committee, uh, or who will be shortly on committee, welcome to uh, the Society. You're in a position where you can influence the direction that the Society goes in, but of course that comes with uh, responsibilities, and of course uh, with responsibilities sometimes also come praise and also criticism. So uh, it's, it's a very toughening experience. Uh, the vacancies that have been filled so far by the nomination, uh, President, only one person stood for that, and that's uh, David Girling this year, so I declare him uh, elected as President in his absence out of the room. Uh, we have one nomination for Vice President, which is uh, myself, and uh, consequently I declare myself as Vice President next year. Uh, secretary, we have one nomination, Sally Zetter again, so I declare the Secretary for 2003. Treasurer, one nomination as well, Marty Rudd again, so I declare him as uh, Treasurer of 2003. Public Officer, one nomination, Russell Thompson, and I declare him again uh, Public Officer next year. Editor, one nomination, Richard Pollard, so he's the editor again uh, next year. So we'll continue on with uh, the quality of the newsletter. Ordinary members, as you, you saw the names, we have nominations for the five positions. We've got six nominations, and they're what uh, David is counting up at the moment. So I declare those members that I've uh, called out so far as uh, elected to those office bearer positions and the ordinary members will be uh, later on in the meeting when David is finished. Um, those who, the one member who's unsuccessful in coming onto subcommittee, whoever that may be, uh, should not feel disheartened in the slightest because we, uh, on subcommittee, uh, we have subcommittees within the committee that will more than happily use uh, any assistance. It's just uh, for uh, official purposes, we have, uh, according to our constitution, five ordinary members to fill. So don't, don't feel uh, left out. You'll definitely, uh, your, your offer of uh, assistance will be greatly accepted. Peter, could I interrupt for a moment? Yes, Bob. At this particular AGM, could I ask if, if the situation is repeated next year, could we be told a little bit, little bit about who the prospective committee members are? Because there are members on the sheet that I don't really know about. I've just noticed that mm -hmm. um, one person I don't know. Yep. Okay, good point, Bob. Yeah, we have that What about each of us Um, probably a bit late now that people have voted. But uh, no, good, uh, good call. Yeah, I, I, 
right, that's uh, the elections. Uh, we're down to number 14, special business. Well, there was no special business uh, notified in the last uh, edition of Scorpius, so we skip over that one. Uh, coming to almost the end of the AGM now is the uh, other things. Uh, Richard Pollard, uh, who uh, can't come tonight because obviously for his uh, night duty, he's, uh, as I said earlier, Scorpius editor, he speaks at public nights, he's a radio presenter, and he also monitors the, uh, moderates the uh, Meteor Network. Um, other regular segment uh, presenters, uh, Bob Hill down the front here does Sky for the Month every month and uh, prepares the handouts at his own cost that uh, he uh, passes around. Uh, Ian Porter, who's not here tonight, I don't think, uh, prepares the What Goes Up segment. And uh, Bruce Gasser has thrown in a couple of solar segments as well uh, during the year. Roger Giller, who's now moved up to Sydney permanently, uh, he's also done regular segments with uh, the Aurora and uh, around the Southern Aurora uh, telephone network. Uh, Carl Moser, who's not here tonight, and Peter Norman for the supper at these meetings. Thank you very much uh, for those throughout the year. Uh, whilst on the subject of supper, we have the barbecue chefs from uh, the Briars. There's uh, Jane McConnell, David Gerling, Richard Pollard, and Sally Zetter, who've uh, donned the apron at uh, each of uh, the various gatherings and uh, uh, being the chefs. And we thought that Jane McConnell, obviously, for the running the library, that's uh, one of the tasks that's very difficult, usually, to get people to uh, fill, which need uh, very meticulous attention to detail. Uh, Greg Richards, who is here tonight for uh, mowing the briars. Uh, Jeremy Scott and Greg Walton, who are starting, essentially, a de facto instrument-making group. It's becoming more and more of a, a formal instrument-making group, and also uh, embarking on what I guess I could call the Arthur Higginson project. Um, which is uh, looking at the Arthur Higginson uh, telescope. I don't think Jeremy's here tonight. Is he? uh, thank you also to the contributors to the newsletter, because without your input, then there wouldn't be uh, very much of a newsletter at all. And of course, those many, many of you who do actually turn up for the school and public night, some with your telescopes, some without telescopes, just to uh, turn up and help talk to the kids uh, under the stars. Thank you uh, for all of those. And last but not least, those that uh, kindly assist by bringing other, other uh, members to meetings where they can't uh, come along themselves. Right, well that's uh, the other thanks, and uh, at that I'll close the AGM, uh, leaving only open the Treasurer's Report, uh, which uh, I'll defer to the uh, January General Meeting of the Society. Okay, AGM done. Russell Thompson's baby's been for you? Uh, I don't know, I haven't actually heard, but it must be any time now. Well, at that, at that last meeting, or the other Telstar so I bought the in Brian day, it was only a few days off there before I got a week off. Yes, yeah. Oh, there'll be something in Scorpio, something in Scorpio. I would guess so, because otherwise you see there's a new astronomer, astronomer's <laughs> actually coming. Okay, um, in that case, uh, Chris, would you like to uh, come up and uh, begin? Oh, raffle. Oh, okay. Um, I'm get, getting a uh, hint here that I should pass around the, the raffle while Chris is speaking. For those of you who wish to um, uh, put it in, uh, $1 per ticket, and the raffle prize tonight is uh, two books. Uh, one on impact, undoubtedly something to do with the uh, uh, common and asteroid impacts, and Patrick Moore on Mars. So pass that round. Chris uh, has finally come down from uh, Swinburne University, uh, which is up in Hawthorne, the Hawthorne campus, to come and uh, speak to us on uh, just three numbers. And uh, there was uh, going to be a trainee astrophysicist here tonight that was uh, quite keen. I'm not sure if they've actually turned up. They have uh, welcome. And uh, I, I guess you're an astrophysicist, don't you? Yes. And uh, with that, I, uh, I'd like to welcome Chris to our meeting and uh, make you feel welcome. Well, thank you very much um, to the Astronomical Society friends and to Ian, who's just uh, popped out, um, for inviting me along uh, this evening. Uh, it's always nice to come and talk to uh, various um, amateur societies because it, uh, Peter's just saying there was one trainee astrophysicist who hoped to be here tonight. Well, I'd like to think that. 
tonight, you're all trainee astrophysicists uh, because my topic is cosmology and trying to give you a bit of a flavour of what the current thinking is about um, how the universe got to be the way that it is today and the fact that you can account for most of what's going on uh, with just the uh, values of three particular numbers. Uh, now before I get into my presentation, I'd just like to put in a couple of very quick um, advertisements. Uh, one is that you might have heard of our Astronomy Online program where we teach astronomy over the internet. Um, if anyone's interested in finding out more about that, uh, you can uh, look at our webpage or come and talk to me uh, later on this evening. And some of the material that I'll be presenting tonight uh, was developed by our various online people. Uh, and also, um, possibility of a future uh, excursion for you to invite you to come to Swinburne University to see our virtual reality theatre um, where we present astronomy in a slightly different fashion in, in 3D. <coughs> the best place to start uh, any discussion on cosmology is to try and answer uh, one very important question and that is why is the night sky dark? I'm going to take you back in time. We're going to go back to the days of the ancient Greek astronomers. And they're uh, fairly simplistic at the time view of the cosmos whereby we have the Earth at the centre of the universe and we have the Moon and the Sun and the other planets on spheres which are surrounding the Earth. And for them, having a night sky that was mostly dark was quite uh, easy or straightforward to accept because the only places that you had stars were either where they were attached to this outer sphere or perhaps there was some kind of um, enormous fire or flame outside the sphere and these were holes in the outside sphere. So this solid object with stars attached to it or holes within it, you, had, you could see the light where the stars were, you could see darkness everywhere else. It wasn't a problem for them. Unfortunately, um, the level of knowledge increased with time and those simple uh, pre-Copernian notions were, were put aside and in the 19th century you have a situation where there's now an understanding that the Earth is not the centre of um, the universe, that the Earth goes around the Sun, that there are these other stars which perhaps are now something um, a bit different and the question uh, that you now start to uh, have to think about and it's called Olber's Paradox, though um, Olber was not the first one to propose it, was this. If you lived in an infinite universe, and at the time, we're talking 19th century, they believed that the universe was infinite in size and infinite in age. Well, if you live in an infinite universe of stars, and those stars have all been shining for a sufficiently long period of time, there is no way the night sky can be dark. So let me try and demonstrate to you why this is a paradox. Well, let's place ourselves around one particular star, and it doesn't matter which star that we're picking, but any direction that we look at from that star, eventually, in an infinite universe, you'll hit another star. So you can think of it as the light from any direction in the sky will be coming from a star somewhere, and that light will reach you. So if you've got long enough, and you've got enough stars, then the sky should be completely bright. That's why we have referred to this as a paradox, because the night sky isn't very bright, it's dark. So trying to understand um, what the relationship between these things is was a very important answer to arrive at. Well, there were some proposals put together by various um, astronomers, and one of those uh, said, okay, the reason that some of those stars, some of those lines of sight, um, don't reach us is because you put dust in the way. <coughs> well, it's a great idea, and we do know that dust does absorb um, certain wavelengths of light, but unfortunately, if you have an infinite amount of time, you'll heat up that dust until it reaches a level where it is emitting just as much light as the stars were. So putting the dust in the way is not a solution in an infinite universe because that dust is going to heat up and the problem is still there that the night sky should be bright. So then they started to think, well, maybe our original idea about an infinite universe is wrong. 
maybe we actually live in a universe that has a finite size. And if that's the case, then not every direction that you look at will end up with a star. Some directions you look at will just have nothing in them. Going together with that was the suggestion that, well, maybe it could still be infinite in size, but it might not be infinite in age. And so light from very distant stars could just take a really long time to reach us. And so those particular parts of the sky that appear dark are areas that the light hasn't had time to reach us yet. So these were the various ideas that were going around in the 19th century, but there was no real uh, reason that they could come up with to suggest why the universe should be either finite in size or finite in age. And then a young man called Albert Einstein came along, and he uh, published his theory at age 36. So if I'm going to do anything as good as Einstein, I've got six years left. It's not looking good. Um, published his general theory of relativity, where he replaced the ideas of Isaac Newton as far as how gravity works with his own uh, different theory. And with general relativity, you can actually write down three equations that will uh, describe the overall properties of the universe. And those equations were first written down by uh, a Russian uh, scientist, Alexander Friedman. And several years later, uh, Georges Lemaitre wrote down the same set of equations based on Einstein's theory. And these, these equations describe what will happen <coughs> to the size of the universe as time changes. They found a very interesting thing. There was only really one parameter or one value that controlled different types of universes. By changing just one number, you could have a drastic effect on what the outcome of your universe was. And we now know this number as a maybe not. So I'm going to talk about three numbers tonight. This is the first of the numbers. We want to work out what is the value of omega naught because it has enormous consequences for our understanding of the universe. Now, I don't really want to show you the equations that uh, Friedman and Lasha wrote down because they're quite hairy. But what I can show you are some graphs of the results. So let's just look at uh, this graph we're about to plot. Um, up this axis here, we have some measurement of the size of the universe. And along this axis, we have some measurement of age. So I can put a point on this graph, which I've labeled up here as now, when the size of the universe is equal to 1 in units of size of the universe at the moment. And the time today is time equals 0. So times in the future are going to have uh, bigger numbers, and times in the past are going to have negative numbers. Now, one of the things that Friedman and Lamartra found was the only stable models that they could come up with, that is, universes that didn't just instantaneously disappear, were universes that for some reason were expanding or getting bigger with time. So we're just going to concentrate on those particular models without trying to answer for the moment why those models might even exist in the first place. So here we go. Here's our first solution. If omega naught has the value of 1, then the universe gets bigger as time goes on. And so you can imagine extending this this uh, line further and further along as time gets bigger and bigger. So we're working in units of billions of years, so 50 billion, 100 billion, 150 billion years, the universe keeps getting bigger. Or, if omega naught, for example, has the value of 1.9, then the universe will continue to get bigger for about another 60 billion years, and then it will decrease in size until about 130 billion years from now, it's uh, got zero size, so the entire universe has shrunk down to a point. Or, we, here we have an example where omega naught is 0.3, and again, uh, we have a universe that as time goes on, gets bigger and bigger, only this time it's getting bigger and bigger faster than this omega naught equals 1 line. These are the only three interesting regions of values for omega naught. We have exactly equal to 1, or we have numbers that are bigger than 1 and they all have the same behaviour where they get bigger and then turn over. 
or we have omega naught less than 1 and the universe gets bigger and bigger, faster and faster and faster. One question, why are the numbers limited to that small range? Uh, they're, they're not. They can take on any value between 0 and infinity. And so, I, um, sorry, 0 on this side. So if we had a, a universe with omega naught equals 0, um, it's kind of a, as I'll point out in a second, it's a fairly meaningless uh, result, but you can have 0 0.0001, or you can have omega naught is infinity and the thing would just go to 0. Uh, so the omega naught numbers can go to infinity, <coughs> go to infinity in principle. Why is it restricted to such a small range there? Um, because they look nice when I plotted them. The critical one is the point, is the, is the equals one, as I've now put out. What Omega Nord is telling us is the future of the universe. It's going to tell us, does the universe keep getting bigger, or does it get bigger and then get smaller again? The interpretation of what Omega Nord is, is it's a direct measurement of how much matter there is in the universe. How much stuff, how much mass, how many galaxies, how many stars, how much uh, dark matter and so forth that we can't see. It's measuring the amount of matter. Omega naught equals 1, as we just saw, was a very special solution. Because if you have just the right amount of material in the universe, then these equations predict that the universe will keep expanding but as soon as you put just a tiny little bit less mass in, or a tiny little bit more mass in than one, then something else happens. So what we actually have, because it's general relativity at the core of all this, it's talking about what the gravitational effect is. So let me try and now explain the interpretation of this result. If we have a universe which is full of stars and gas and dust and dark matter and all the other sorts of things that go into the universe, and we accept for the moment that it's a universe that's getting bigger because the equations say it must get bigger, then all of that mass is trying to gravitationally do things to the other mass. It's trying to actually pull things together. Okay? So we've got a universe that's expanding for some reason that we don't understand at the moment, and we have mass within that universe trying to pull it back down. If you've got too much mass, then gravity wins. And no matter how far apart you try and put the mass, it will draw itself back in together and the universe collapses. So these are the parts of the graph where omega naught is greater than 1. We've got too much mass, too much stuff in the universe, it's going to collapse. If you don't have enough stuff, then gravity can't win. This mysterious expansion will move the material too far apart that no matter how hard the gravity tries to pull it back together, it can't, and so omega naught is this nice balance just in the middle. To a theorist, the best possible answer would be that omega naught equals 1, because then our equations is just so easy to write down, because you just put a little 1 everywhere, things cancel out, it's all very good. The universe is not quite that way, <coughs> unfortunately. Alright, now we looked at these various solutions for omega naught, and we looked at what happens to the universe in the future. Well, here we are now. What happened in the past? Well, you can run these equations backwards in time and see what happens. And they all make the same prediction. They all say that at some point in the deep dark distant past, the universe had zero size. It started off incredibly small, and it got bigger. So let's zoom in on that, and let's plot these three different solutions again. So here we have omega naught equals 1, that's our nice critical uh, case. Omega naught greater than 1, so this is a universe that's going to collapse. And omega naught less than 1, this is a universe that's going to expand. What we notice is that these three different values all predict different times at which the universe had zero size. So not only does omega naught tell us about the future of the universe, it tells us about the past, and it tells us how old the universe is. And so what it's predicting is that if we could measure omega naught, and we found out that it's 1.9, then we know that the universe is about 12 billion years old. But if we find out that it's 
value is actually closer to 0.3, we have a much older universe, one that's perhaps 17 or 18 billion years. So knowing what this number is tells us the future, but it also tells us how old the universe is. And that's very important for our understanding of theories like how galaxies form, how stars form, how planets form. Because knowing those time scales then has an effect on our theories on for each of those, each of those phenomena. Alright, so this is the situation we had in 1920s, 1930s. We had Friedman and Lavatra saying that with Einstein's theory, they could predict that the future of the universe depended on or maybe not. And they also predicted, well they didn't understand it, that the universe was getting bigger with time and that therefore we had an age of about 10 or 20 billion years. And lo and behold, this is the best solution for all this paradox. <laughs> the reason why the night sky is not dark is that final one that I even proposed, that the universe began a finite time ago, and so there just hasn't been enough time for light <coughs> from any direction to reach us. So if you can hang around long enough, eventually the night sky could be completely bright. There's also there's a trick to that as well that anyone wants to try and identify later on. Now Einstein, can I just make a comment? Um, when, when, when you say you know the night sky, that is only, that is only limited to around us as the Earth. In in deep space, it is dark. Uh, no, it's not because you can still see you can still see yeah, stars. It's, in, it's in contrast to our situation here. Um, it's. No, it's, it's, it's exactly the same. Um, it's not exactly the same, because we've got a, we've got a sun scenario here on a daily basis. Uh, if, you were, if you were still to go somewhere, um, it, it, makes, it makes no difference to the paradox. If you go somewhere that's the furthest possible distance you can go from a nearby star, then the paradox is still that any direction you should look at, you should finish on a star, either within the Milky Way galaxy or in another galaxy somewhere else. So this whole old, old paradox applies everywhere? Applies everywhere, yep. Okay. Could I be a heretic? Yes. <laughs> Surely this would depend on the sensitivity of the, of the instrument or the device that we use to protect light. Yes. Our eyes being the least sensitive. Yep. So photographic plates, you can certainly see more light. That's correct. And photographic uh, plates would have some limitations. So my uh, suggestion is if you have something with infinite sensitivity, perhaps it would be, would be, would be bright. Well, certainly, um, and as we'll see in a moment, if you go to other wavelengths altogether, there is stuff everywhere. So um, it, is, it is an interesting one, and, and that's why any, any paradox, if you push it hard enough, you'll, you'll break it and find something else that, that goes away. But we, we know there's stuff everywhere. We just take a look at it because we can't see it and see what we yes, can see. Yes, that's right. <laughs> But it could be it could be worse. I think it's the bottom line is that it could be worse. Yeah, thank you. It's not worse. <laughs> All right. So um, we had this we had a situation then where they've predicted an expanding universe. But Einstein said, "Well, I don't really like that idea. I, I don't I don't feel comfortable with a universe that's getting bigger in time. Why should that be the case?" And so what Einstein did was he introduced something called the cosmological constant, and this is the second of my two numbers tonight, except it's the one that I'm going to talk about third, because it didn't last very long. Um, Einstein put it into his theory of general relativity as a way of stopping the expansion, that although the, his equation seemed to say, well, look, the universe is getting bigger with time, the cosmological constant was put in as a way of stopping that expansion, so that the universe's size was the same all of the time. Then he changed his mind. And he said, why on earth did I think that? That was such a huge mistake. I actually got it right the first time. Um, I should never have put this in. And the reason he changed his mind was because of this man here, Edwin Hubble. Now, I'm sure that many of you have heard about Hubble's law and Hubble's constant. And Hubble's constant is the third of my, of my numbers for tonight. Well, in 1929, Edwin Hubble was observing uh, distant galaxies. And he discovered that these galaxies were moving away from us. He measured that if you could work out how fast a particular galaxy was moving, and you worked out how far away from us that galaxy was, and you drew a graph that they all fell on a straight line. Well, 
Scientists love straight lines because that usually says there's something fundamental going on here. And so you can write down Hubble's law that says the velocity at which a galaxy is moving depends on how far away that galaxy is and this number, this parameter called Hubble's constant. So this is our third number. This is a, another very important number for us to try and understand and then look at the, the consequences of it. Well, how on earth did Hubble actually work out that galaxies were moving away from us? What he did was he looked at the spectrum of light from a star. Now, all atoms uh, will emit very characteristic um, <coughs> frequencies. And so if you put white light in through a prism and you break it up into this rainbow, um, then you have particular lines in here where not only do these atoms emit the frequency of light, they also absorb ones. And so what we're looking at here is absorption lines of, could be hydrogen, could be helium, or could be anything else. So if you look at a star and you look at a spectrum and you work out what lines are in there and the spacing between them, you know exactly what elements are in there. So if you can get the spectrum of the sun, you'll see signatures of hydrogen, helium, and some, some lithium, and, and everything else that's in the sun. The same applies to a galaxy, because a galaxy is just a collection of 100,000 million stars. And so if you add up all the individual spectrums in there, you get uh, all the hydrogen features added together, and all the helium features, and so forth. So you can look at what chemicals, what elements are present in a galaxy. So this is just a, a very simplified example of what a spectrum from a galaxy might look at if that galaxy was stationary compared to us, the observer. If the galaxy is moving towards you though, you find that the spectral lines are shifted towards the blue end of the frequency, so we call the spectrum, we call this a blue shift. And if the galaxy is moving away from us, then they're shifted towards the red end of the spectrum, and we call it a red shift. This is very similar to the Doppler effect, which is a phenomenon that you're probably all very familiar with. When you stand on the side of the road and a, uh, an ambulance or a police car goes past you and you listen to the pitch of the siren, it changes. And that has to do with the, for a siren, it's sound waves coming out of the siren. And as the um, vehicle is moving towards you, the spacing between sound waves is, is pushed together. And if the siren's moving away from you, then the distance between the successive waves is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So here we have a very similar idea that says, well, if the spectral lines are moving towards the blue end, that's a blue shift. Galaxies coming towards us. Galaxy moving away from us, these spectral lines are shifted to the red. Nearly every single galaxy that Edwin Hubble looked at had a red shift. And then you could relate that amount of shift to a velocity, how fast it was actually moving. So the further away from us a galaxy is, the greater that shift towards the red end of the spectrum. So here we can see some examples. Here's a nearby galaxy, and here's a more distant galaxy, and those spectral lines. The spacing between them agrees with what we think it should be a particular element, but their position is, is shifted. How did they measure how far away the galaxies were? Well, that's, that's a, that was a big challenge, and it still is a big challenge. Um, just very briefly, uh, he was looking at Cepheid variable stars. And the idea is that a Cepheid variable star, there's a very strong relationship between how bright it gets and how long it takes for successive brightness peaks. A Cepheid variable is obviously a variable star changing in brightness. If you look at nearby variable stars, <coughs> you can variable stars and you can uh, calibrate your variability period versus brightness, then you look for Cepheid variables in another galaxy and you see how bright they appear and what the period is and you can, you can account then for how much further away those stars must be. So that was a fairly, a fairly simple, it probably took them months and months and months to get the data, but that was the, the technique they were using. It's one that we still um, use. Now looking back in, out into space is very similar to looking back in time because light from these distant galaxies is taking uh, some finite time to reach us. And so you can relate um, the age of the universe at the time the light was emitted with this redshift number over here. So there's a nice little equation. And it's fairly common for astronomers to say, oh, we've just discovered a new <coughs> galaxy at a redshift of one. And so what that means is that we're seeing that galaxy 
when it was the light came when the universe was half its current age. Or perhaps they found a quasar at redshift 3, and so then we're seeing the universe when it was a quarter of its current age, and, and so forth. And again, redshift 9, when we break, we could find anything at all in redshift 9. We don't have telescopes that can do it at the moment, but that would let us probe back to ages of one tenth of the universe. So this redshift is quite an interesting uh, number. <coughs> all right. Um, here is uh, an updated version of the type of thing that Edwin Hubble was doing. This is the 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey. This was a survey that took about five years to complete. Uh, it was performed by astronomers from, um, I think, 11 different countries, but using a telescope in Australia, the Anglo-Australian Telescope at Siding Spring. And what they did was they measured the locations of 250,000 galaxies. And they in two... Um, quite large wedges, the other one sort of sits over there. Every dot in here is a galaxy, and the color of the dots is indicating something about how, uh, how many galaxies there are in a particular region. So here's a region, red means lots of galaxies, and blue means not quite as many. So you can see very high concentration of galaxies here, whereas here's a region with hardly any galaxies at all. We're looking at redshift, so what they've done is they've obtained the spectrum of 250,000 galaxies and then worked out um, how far away these objects are. Once you have a map like this, there's quite a lot of really good science you can do with it. In fact, one of the simplest things to pull out is a value for omega naught. So, this is uh, some of the best evidence that says omega naught equals 0.3. So, on those graphs that I showed you before, that suggests we live in a universe that is going to expand forever. All right, but let's go back to Hubble's constant. What exactly does Hubble's constant <laughs> tell us? Well, it says that if all the galaxies are actually moving away from us at the moment, then if you wind back time, there must have been a point when they were all at the same spot. So here we go. Somewhere in the past, all the galaxies were together. Somewhere in the future, they've all moved away from us. Now, our equation said that the velocity of these galaxies depended on Hubble's parameter and how far away they were. But a velocity is really how far you travel over how long you took to get there. So, 60 kilometers per hour means that if you take one hour, you'll travel 60 kilometers. So, we can then interpret Hubble's constant as 1 divided by how long it took the galaxy to get where it is today. Or, it's 1 over the age of the universe. So, Omega naught told us something about the age of the universe. And Hubble's constant also tells us something about the age of the universe. If we interpret these galaxies, this um, recession velocity, as winding them all back to being at this one spot. Here's the current accepted value, range of values for Hubble's constant. That's an awful number. I don't want to, have to write that down as a, as a theorist. Um, it's, it's nasty. So, what we do instead is we use a completely different set of units and we get now nice numbers like 50 and 80. If I can write, punch them into my calculator in, in no time. But what we've done is we've done a little bit of a trick here. If you look at the units up here, we have um, this s to the minus 1 means 1 divided by seconds or per second. Here we have kilometers per second per megaparsec. Now, a megaparsec is a measurement of distance, and a kilometer is a measurement of distance. So what I've got is a distance per second divided by distance. And so my distance factors cancel out, but in a nice way, that gives me big numbers. The other way of thinking about this is a galaxy that is one megaparsec away, or one million parsecs, or about three million light years, is traveling at about 50 to 80 kilometers per second. A galaxy that's two megaparsecs away is moving twice as fast, and, and so forth. Well, if we go back to Edwin Hubble's first uh, experiments, um, first measurements of this, he determined a Hubble's constant of about 500 or 600. Um, we do have to treat these numbers with caution. First of all, his method of determining the distance wasn't very good. 
He was looking at nearby galaxies, and unfortunately, the nearest galaxies to us are not moving away from us. They're actually moving towards us, or we're moving towards them. Um, so galaxies within the local group, the nearest 30 or 40 galaxies, should be thrown out of the sample um, because they're not behaving in the same way that most of the other remaining galaxies are. So he was, he was biased by those results. Time goes on, instruments get better, techniques of measuring um, the actual amount of shift in the spectrum, of measuring the distances to galaxies improve and improve. And by 1960, we had somewhere uh, that was quite tightly bound between about 50 and 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Now it's quite interesting, um, a number, uh, there were sort of two schools of thought. One said it's absolutely got to be 100, and one said it's absolutely got to be 50. And the two protagonists um, were De Vaucalers and Sandage, and they both argued furiously for years that no, it's 50, no, it's 100. Well, then De Vaucalers died, and everyone else said, well, actually, we knew it wasn't really either of those numbers. We were just a little bit frightened to, uh, to fight too much. <laughs> and it's actually somewhere in the middle of those. So if we zoom in now and we look at the last 20 years or so, we can see that the numbers are looking pretty good between about 80 and, and 50. And there's a variety of different methods, um, as the question was asked before, how on earth do you measure distances? Well, they use these Cepi variable stars. They also use uh, type 1 supernovae, which I'll talk about um, in a moment. And so these different methods now all seem to be looking quite uh, good at a number in here. It would still be nice to bring these um, error bars down. And one of the, the key projects of the Hubble Space Telescope was to actually try and measure Hubble's constant to about 10% accuracy. Alright, the galaxies seem to all be moving away from us. Have we done something horrible to all the other galaxies that they're all shunning us and saying, whoa, let's get away from the Milky Way? Well, the answer is no, it's not. If you pick any pair of galaxies, so here I've just I've picked this galaxy and this galaxy, and I've picked another pair here and here, and if we had uniform expansion so that the amount of increase in size is the same no matter where you are in the universe, then the distance between each pair of galaxies increases by exactly the same amount. So here we had um, the original separation, we expanded a little bit, and everything's 1.33 times bigger, 1.67, and so forth. The distance between every pair of galaxies increases. The consequence of that is that no matter which galaxy you pick as your own galaxy, it looks like all the other galaxies are moving away from you. So that might take a little bit of thinking about, but it's because of this uniform expansion. If the universe over here was expanding a little bit faster than over here, which was expanding a little bit faster than over here, then there would be particular places that you could stand that the galaxies um, wouldn't all look as if they were, it wouldn't look like you were some special place. Alright, so we now have two uh, pieces of evidence suggesting that the universe had a beginning. We have the equations of Friedman and Lamartra saying, well, our theory based on this Omega Null parameter says that the universe began at some time in the past. Our interpretation of what the Hubble's law, this recession of galaxies is all about, says that the universe began at some time in the past. Where is the evidence? Well, that came in 1965 thanks to uh, Penzias and Wilson and this instrument here that no matter how hard they tried to clean it out and remove all the sources of interference, they kept detecting a signal that came from any direction in the sky that was as if something that was about uh, minus 270 degrees Celsius was radiating away. They had actually discovered what we now call the <coughs> cosmic microwave background, and they got a Nobel Prize for it. And this is one of the uh, most well um, recorded observations now. This, this is just an extraordinary. Um, feat of agreement between theory and observation. This graph here is showing you um, energy, and it doesn't really matter what the, what the units are, it's just saying how much energy do we get versus frequency. And this is the data that an uh, experiment called the Cosmic Microwave Background Explorer, or COBE, recorded. And it looks, it looks pretty good there, it's not too many wiggles. 
the theoretical prediction of what this result should look like <coughs> is this red line. This is not a fit to the data, this is the predicted value. And they are so close together that it's scary. It's very rare for any type of observational uh, result between theory and, and some observation to match as closely as this thing did. Now what is this? Well, this is something called a black body curve. And a black body curve is a, an ideal um, emitter of energy. So what we're looking at is how much energy versus frequency. Um, and the bump in this depends very strongly on temperature. Um, an example of black body that you use every day is um, your gas cooker. The hottest part of the flame is blue and the cooler part of the flame is red. And so you can relate frequency to the colour. So red is, I'm going to get this right, red is a lower frequency and so the temperature uh, peaks at a, um, sorry, at lower frequencies this peak corresponds to lower temperatures. So if I was to move this peak up here, it says to a high frequency, it says my object is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Um, so in this case here, if your peak is at about 130 gigahertz, which is a microwave um, frequency, then you've got something which has got a temperature of about minus 270 Kelvin. So let me just go back again. So what I'm trying to say here is this minus 270 degrees Celsius um, signal that was found by Penzias and Wilson corresponds to something that's exactly 3 degrees Kelvin or minus 270 degrees Celsius that's visible on the sky that matches exactly these, um, these properties. What is it? Well, what we interpret it now is this is the remnant of the Big Bang. This is the remnant of a very, the very beginnings of the universe that was very, very hot. And if we then follow our understanding now that the universe is getting bigger, as it gets bigger, it gets cooler to a point where now it's cooled so much that that initial energy is about 3 degrees Kelvin. So that very uniform distribution that you saw there is some of the best evidence that we have that the universe was incredibly hot when it began. Now the Big Bang is a bit of a, a strange expression and I think it's, it's one that's done actually more harm than good as far as um, the popular <coughs> perception of what the Big Bang is all about. When we think of explosions, we're always thinking of explosions that occur within some space. So you can think of a firecracker going off in this room, it's an explosion within the space of the room. The Big Bang was an explosion that created the room at the same time. There's nothing that it's exploding within. It's, it's because there's nothing outside the universe. It's constructing it all somehow, in some way that we really don't understand um, from, that, from that initial start. During the Big Bang, this enormously hot uh, cosmic fireball, all of space was created. And as time went on, the space got bigger and bigger and bigger until we have a universe that's currently the size that it is. All of time was created. There's no um, real way of, of talking about time before the Big Bang because it's a concept that doesn't really exist. All of matter and energy were created. Somehow all of this energy came from somewhere. We don't know how, but it was there. And as the universe got cooler and cooler, this energy turned into matter, according to Einstein's famous e equals mc squared. It says energy and mass are related. So everything was created in the Big Bang. And since that time, since that Big Bang, the universe has got bigger. So this is our current uh, understanding of what Friedman and Lamarck's equations were saying, what the um, results of Hubble, that galaxies are moving away from each other, and the observational results of Penzias and Wilson that said there is something out there that's incredibly uniform that has a temperature of about 3 degrees Kelvin. <coughs> since that time, the universe cools, and as I said, that microwave background remnant is the, the leftover signature from that fireball. Well, the microwave background is very uniform um, in all directions. In fact, if we were to plot a, a, the entire sky, then where colour represents temperature, the entire night sky is exactly the same temperature. It's about 2.73 Kelvin. 
until you start to look a little bit closer. If you go to a bit more accuracy, and so we subtract off that 2.73 Kelvin, what we now see is something a bit different. We can see there's a little bit of blue and a little bit of purple. And what this says, it's a little bit tiny bit hotter over here, and it's a tiny bit colder over here. What we've just found is that our galaxy is moving in a particular place in the sky. It's actually moving to this part of the sky, which happens to be uh, the Virgo supercluster of galaxies. This is another example of a Doppler shift, just like um, those shifts in the spectral line. The motion of our galaxy changes the temperature that we record very slightly. Okay, so if we can understand this, if we can model this, we can take it away and see what's left over. One question, when you say our galaxy, does that include the local group? Yeah, when you, you have to, um, I'm, I'm sort of skimming over the, the exact details of how it's done, but you're, you're subtracting off all the, the nearby motions that we can account for and then looking at what's, at what's left after that. So you, the previous comment that um, the local group is moving towards us is just a, a coincidental thing within our, within our confinement. Yeah, within, when, you, when you have about 30 or 40 galaxies, what they tend to want to do is move towards each other. Yeah. And they, um, sometimes will collide, but usually they just go whizzing past and then they'll move out and come back in again. Um, so, what we're seeing here is actually the effects of the Coby satellite going around the Earth, the Earth going around the Sun, the Sun going around the centre of the galaxy, the galaxy moving within the local group, and the local group moving towards the Virgo supercluster. But if you draw a little arrow that, and you add up all those bits and pieces, the main bit that's left over is that motion towards, towards Virgo. So we take that off, and we look now at variations of the 0 0.00001 Kelvin mark, and we now see this incredible fuzzy structure. This is the signature of early matter in the universe, the first stuff that was created that ultimately went on to form galaxies. If this lumpiness wasn't here, I wouldn't be here tonight to actually talk about it because nothing would ever have been created. There would have been perfectly smooth distribution of matter anywhere, everywhere. Then there's no reason for stars and galaxies to form because they only form when gravity starts to win in one of these little regions. So you can think of these blue regions as areas that have got a little bit more mass than their neighbours and every time <coughs> that happens, gravity pulls material in get enough gravity, you form a star. You get enough stars, you've got a galaxy, and so forth. So this was the signature that they found of the very early universe. So we can now go away, and we can add up all of these different contributions. And so here we have the uniform night sky, we've got the motion of Virgo, we've got all sorts of other little combinations that when you add them all up together, what you want to end up with is something that looks very much like um, this initial structure version. And we can plot a graph that we call the power spectrum that tells us how much of each of these components we need to add together. So if we add one lot of this plus three lots of this plus seven lots of this plus half of one of those and so forth, you eventually build up the total picture. And we can plot this now. This is the relative contribution of each of these components versus the actual component. And what you predict based on different versions of Omega Nord and so forth is these various wiggly lines. And an experiment called Boomerang that uh, was launched a couple of years ago measured these data points on here. And so what you're trying to do is look at which one of your lines best agrees with your measurements. And the answers all seem to suggest that Omega was equal to 1. But the results from the 2DF survey says omega naught is 0.3. So here we've got a bit of a conflict going on that we're trying to understand how do you get one result that looks pretty good and another result that also looks pretty good. Well, the answer might lie with Albert Einstein. And some recent observations within the last 10 years or so that have brought back into favour um, Einstein's cosmological constant. Here we're looking at some very high redshift supernovae uh, that have a, a star that has exploded within the galaxy there. So we've looked at it, we're blowing it up here. 
And three weeks before the supernova was discovered and then the supernova discovery, you can see that this little part here has got a little bit brighter. If you subtract those two images away, there's your image of the supernova. Once you know where these particular supernovae are, you follow them for a couple of weeks and you look at how the brightness of them changes. And it changes in a very uniform pattern. Two teams have been looking at these. Um, Brian Schmidt, who's based at Mount Stromlo in Canberra, and Saul Perlmutter and his team, who were based in the US. Well, uh, Perlmutter found the first couple of these and, and took the early running. Uh, Schmidt has now pretty much pushed Perlmutter completely out of the game. Uh, they've just got too good at finding these supernova, and they've found a lot of them at large distances from them. When you look at the supernovae, there's some encouraging evidence to say that not only is the universe getting bigger, it's actually getting bigger at a faster and faster rate. So here's some of their data. Uh, this is a measurement of how bright the star, the supernova is, versus redshift. So just reminding you that the redshift tells you about how, what age the universe was when the light came from it. So here we have redshift of a half, redshift of a one, so the universe was half its current age when the light from these supernova first started out. These are some nice nearby supernova that we use to help calibrate, and these are supernova and distant galaxies. <coughs> what we're trying to do then is find a curve that matches the local stuff and also goes nicely through the data points. Now you can see they're quite scattered up there, so it's very hard to do this accurately at the moment. Those lines depend on what values of omega naught and what <coughs> values of a cosmological constant that you put in. And the best fits are the ones that have a cosmological constant, this lambda naught. So Einstein's greatest blunder of introducing this number actually now turns out it could be his most outstanding insight. It all comes down to a little bit to our interpretation of it. What Einstein was trying to do was to stop the expansion by putting in this cosmological constant term. He didn't want a universe that was getting bigger, so he artificially stopped it getting bigger. We now interpret the cosmological constant as something that makes the universe get bigger, faster and faster. It's a bit like anti-gravity. Um, if you have two objects, two galaxies, the gravity of them tries to pull them together, but the cosmological constant tries to push them apart. Um, it's also referred to as dark energy that says if you've got a vacuum, a bit of empty space, it actually has some energy that wants to make that bit of vacuum get bigger and bigger. So this is very encouraging that the cosmological constant is important. So we've now looked at uh, three numbers, and let's just summarize again uh, as I finish up about what they're telling us. Omega naught says that how much matter there is. It tells us is the universe going to continue to get bigger or is it going to collapse on itself. Hubble's constant says the galaxies are moving away at a particular speed that depends on how far away they are and it tells us something about the age of the universe. The boomerang result said that when you look at the microwave background it wants omega to be 1. Well, what that tells us is that the cosmological constant is about 0.7 because when you add these two numbers together, they equal 1. They need to equal 1 in order to explain the COVID results. But the supernova results are also telling us that omega naught is about 0.7 when you go away to the analysis. So that's where I'd like to uh, leave you this evening with uh, hopefully an overview of cosmology, perhaps an idea that um, although it might seem like a complex thing trying to understand the universe, all you really need to do is to work out these three numbers. And actually, if David's willing to do another ballot tonight, we can even vote on what <laughs> <laughs> that's, So that's where I'd like to leave it.
super, um, super clusters of galaxies um, throughout the universe seem to be pulling smaller clusters together. And when they say the Big Bang, why is not then the Big Bang just a mass of the super clusters time ago pulling it together, everything all matter, and then another Big Bang formed, you know, and all the universe formed again, and then we had the same thing over again. One of the, the most challenging aspects for cosmologists is that we don't know what happened before the Big Bang. And one of the possibilities is that we have what we call an oscillating universe, where you have, um, a, let's forget how the first Big Bang goes, but you have a universe that expands and then comes down and collapses to a point and then you have another Big Bang that starts the whole thing off again, collapses down, another Big Bang starts again. So we could be cycle number seven, we could be cycle number 7,348 billion, we don't know. But the problem seems to be that our, looking at the results at the moment, it says that our universe is not going to collapse. There's nothing at all from any of our measurements of Omega naught or Lambda naught or Hubble's constant that suggests we're in a universe that is going to collapse down here. So, no matter what number in the cycle we were, it looks like we might be the last one. Um, <coughs> it's, not, it's not super cluster ga galaxies pulling in smaller clusters. The problem, the problem also is that when you get your temperature high enough, and when, when you start to gravitationally pull in little galaxies and big galaxies, you start to raise their temperature. <coughs> when the temperature gets too high, you start to disassociate your stars. They start to pull apart into their constituent atoms. So now you just have a big soup of hydrogen, and helium, and whatever else. You make the temperature bigger and bigger, you now start to break up the hydrogen and the other atoms. They start knocking all the electrons to the left. You start breaking up the protons and everything else. You make the temperature hotter and hotter, um, you start to destroy matter altogether. And the matter turns back and forth into energy and all sorts of other exotic particles and so forth. We're actually looking at the Big Bang in reverse there. The way that the superclusters and galaxies formed originally was all that you had was energy. You didn't have any hydrogen or helium or anything else. All you had was energy. And when that energy reaches <coughs> a nice, stable temperature, then your hydrogen atoms all kind of pop out at that point. And then the temperature goes down again, and various other things go on. That's the slides. Look at um, when the first elementary particles, when the first protons, electrons, and neutrons were actually uh, created. And they occur when the temperature is about 10 and then 15 zeros after it degrees. And that happened uh, about 10 to the minus 12 seconds. So it's a zero decimal point, 12 zeros and a one of a second. Now that seems like it's nothing compared to us, but compared to a universe that's just created, that's an enormously long time to wait. Um, it's like if you think about a, a one-year-old child They've got to wait their entire life for their age to double. But once you become a, a 30 year old, you've got to wait 30 years for your life to double. So these time scales seem incredibly short to us, but they're quite long to them. And it's, this is the point when elementary particles start to occur at this particular temperature. So if you run the universe backward, uh, uh, running it forward now, it's looking at galaxies colliding, superclusters colliding, you reach this temperature again, and all your matter disappears. And so you no longer have clusters and galaxies and so forth, it's got a big soup of stuff. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you said that our universe is expanding at an increasing rate. That, that if, if you interpret the results of the cosmology yeah, process. Yeah. Yes. Now, and you mentioned that <coughs> um, good old Einstein has been re re resurrected in that he's constant now where he was trying to stop things going for whatever reasons. Yep. Um, now is a constant that could be Put in a simple sort of mathematical equation, y will say 3x, with 3 the same as constant. What could x um, be in terms of simple measurements these days? How um, the closest coming to it? I'm not sure there is a simple well, thing that you can measure at the moment. Yeah. Um, that's why the cosmological constant is, is a bit of a tricky one to interpret because a lot of it is is this indirect evidence. We, have, we, have, we can understand omega naught pretty well because that's, that's matter. We, we have a good grip on what matter is. But the cosmological constant seems to be related to vacuums where there's nothing there, so why should nothing actually produce energy, produce 
whatever. And so it's trying to, here we have a problem between now what particle physics is trying to explain and what astronomy is trying to explain because they come with vastly different answers. So that's quite an interesting part of, of physics in general that hopefully within the next 10 or 15 years some understanding. But no, at the moment we don't, we don't really understand what this thing is, it just seems to work nicely. Why are we so incorrect in the idea of well, no, I shouldn't say incorrect. There always seems to be... Why, why is there such big errors? errors? Why are we saying it's between 15 and 20 and not saying it's exactly 7? So it comes back to the question about distances. We don't have a good enough measure to hold distance. We don't have a tape measure that we can run from here to Andromeda to measure the distance accurately. All our measurements are based on what we call the distance ladder, where you look at Cepheid variables and you, and you work out some relationship that says, OK, the galaxy with Cepheid variables is a certain distance away. Now I look for another property that that galaxy has, and there are things like um, the Tully-Fisher relationship and the, um, the something else that looks at how bright a galaxy is in the infrared versus how fast it's rotating. And so then you look at other galaxies that have rotating at a slightly different speed, and, and you relate these things to each other, and you build up and up and up. Um, and it's only when you start to really get all these distance steps correct that you can then say, yep, this is now the correct version of Hubble's constant. And that's what the Hubble Space Telescope was doing, was getting very, very accurate measurements of Cepheid variables. And although they did this experiment for five or 10 years, they only got an accuracy of 10%. Well, that's still, that's still pretty good, because now you, you build the next generation space telescope, and you can probably get it to 1%. And you build the next, next generation space telescope, and you, and you continue to, to narrow that down. I actually noticed in, in your plot that you showed the Hubble constant and the values of over time that there was a, a gap between the 1980s and the 1990s of about 10 years when there weren't anything, there wasn't anything in there. Was that um, around the time of the Hubble telescope mirror uh, problems? So um, there was quite a gap of time where they couldn't use a, a space-based instrument. Might just be that we're the data from I hadn't included all the all things, but it could, it could be that they had reached a point where no new instrument on the ground was was doing anything. Most of those new those points usually come when you build a new instrument that can do something that the previous ones couldn't do. So you go and do those measurements again. But if all you have is just the same instruments and the same telescopes, so then you usually don't bother going over and So it could be that the next jump was Hubble Space Telescope. I'm not, I'm not very sure. Do you have one last question? Oh, well, a couple of, I have one from you, one from you, and you've asked me too many. <laughs> Up the back. Um, just in relation to your mentioning of uh, the local group moving towards the Virgo cluster. I mean, say we're moving towards it, if they're moving at a constant rate uh, from our observation, are we not just moving along with them? Or if we're moving towards them, then obviously... Yeah, you, you, then, right. you then have to be a, bit, a little bit more careful with, with some of the definitions here about things that are moving away. <coughs> and um, you start to have to use the word local um, and just how local is local. Well all galaxies beyond perhaps 10 or 15 million light years are moving away from us and within smaller regions they start to move towards each other. So just like in the local group we have galaxies whizzing around, um, on that kind of length scale this pure Hubble expansion doesn't really work very well. Uh, so you have, you have to modify it based on um, the fact that a real universe has, is lumpy, that it's got regions with lots of material, and then nothing, and then lots of material, and then nothing. Um, like if we go back to that, that 2DF plot that showed um, lots of dots in one particular region, and then, and then nothing. So it's when you kind of you average over the whole everything, the Hubble expansion. But when you start to look at just our galaxy and something else, then the results aren't quite as good, uh, because you now, you now do have to worry about individual motions compared to the motions of, on average, 10 billion galaxies. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess so. I, I just uh, was trying to clarify the idea that if we are if we moving towards them, or well, that they are the Virgo cluster, then where you want that to come? One day we will be part of the Virgo cluster. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And there's one there. Thank you, Chris. The club's probably going to excommunicate me for this. And has uh, back history of the birth on the state. Uh, the cosmic background radiation 
assumes that the, the electromagnetic radiation has slowed down over, over a period of time. Why isn't the redshift due to the same effect? It would still be a very accurate measure of distance. Uh, I cannot for the life of me understand why uh, if light, say, takes uh, 100,000 years to get to us, why the, 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 the frequency has to slow down if it has a redshift, similar to the cosmic background radiation having slowed down. Okay. <coughs> that that um, would uh, question the whole theory of cosmo cos cosmology. Yeah, but it's on that basis of physics, isn't it? I mean, we, we threw out <coughs> physics, what these common yeah. modes are. There's a couple of different, couple of different, different interpretations of that. One, one is this idea of something called the tired light theory that seems to pop up every five or six years. And the idea is that the speed of light changes and that a lot of these cosmological things go away you've got light that the older it is, the faster or slower it actually travels. So that's one part of the problem. Another one is actually looking at what is really causing that shift in the spectral lines. And although the Doppler effect idea, we're thinking like a siren moving across a street and things getting squashed or stretched, the actual redshift is not a strict Doppler effect. The redshift occurs because space is getting bigger. So if you were to draw, um, for example, take a rubber sheet and you draw a nice little uniform wave on it, okay, and then you stretch that sheet out, then the wavelength, the distance between successive peaks when your sheets get bigger, and that's really what this redshift is all about. It says when the light started to leave, so we start to have our first little um, few waves appearing, then the universe got stretched. And so these waves are still trying to move through, but the wavelength's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's things happening, things happening there. Um, so a lot of it um, does have to do with now sort of our understanding of how physics works. And if you want to throw away um, physics, then you can come up with other, other suggestions. Um, what I've presented to you tonight, I guess, is the, the current view based on, on the way that, that it's interpreted. It doesn't mean it's the answer. And as a scientist, there was a little comment I had on that last slide that I didn't uh, actually mention out loud, was this is the answer now, according to our best experiments. But as new observations are made, this could all change. And that's what science is all about. It's being prepared to say what I've told you tonight, if I came back in 50 years and gave the same talk.
sounds quite good. No, it's a shadow of something doing a transit. Well, all the people in there have got tickets on there. Oh, okay, I'll grab them up.
um, in Gemini, uh, Propus or Eta Geminorium, and I'll show you the Christmas cluster, which is there. That is an easy object, 2264. Um, and the reference star is Al Alhina in Gemini, just there. So those three objects, and look, the, the rest is easy stuff. You either use a computer telescope, or you star hop, or you use your eyes and see the moon. There's good old Saturn behaving itself. Um, note its close proximity to the Crab Nebula. Um, on the uh, 15th of December, so um, you might just block the crab nebula out, but it might be kind of everything. Okay, southern sky, um, the usual stuff. Um, it's a bit complex in that area, but if you've got a computer telescope, I, I know some of you hate hearing that word, um, that's why I say it. Uh, if you've got a computer telescope, all that area is available to you because it is a bit complex. Um, and just briefly, I'll show you uh, a variable star up here, um, Beta Dorados. Nothing much to say about it, really, but it's just good fun to see it. Um, on the start of the month, I've mentioned um, wide clusters, CR, that means Kalinda. Um, there are many wide clusters in Canis Major there. 121, 135, 140. Um, a computer telescope would assist in finding them, and they're very wide and they're very bright. Um, okay, that's about it, and um, we shall move on. The best part. Okay, Northern Sky, two variables in the Christmas tree cluster. Okay. There's the in-between bit of Cetus with Myra there. It's a red variable star, okay? That's the star of Pisces, Menkar. Cetus is there and up there. Okay, Myra, if we hit that with binoculars, we see... It. There's nothing much to see with respect to the star. Myra is a, is a, is a long-term reg, uh, regular variable, but it's unpredictable. It varies um, from magnitude 1.7 to 10, but that range also is unpredictable, and it goes over a period of about 7 to 11 months, which is also unpredictable, and that's as far as it being a regular red variable. Lovely field. Um, quite, notice there's quite a few red stars there, um, but um, it's being pointed out as a variable star, and there's a galaxy, um, that's the galaxy 936 there, if any of you are close in the vicinity, okay? That's quite a bright galaxy. So there you go, and if we give it full magnification, we just see Myra, keep it array. Okay, that's one variable. Um, another is Eta Gemini, Geminorum, this is quite nice. Okay. Now, again, easy pickings, there's the Western bit of Gemini, Western Gemini, there's M35, and Propus is that star there, that's the other a variable. This is, um, I think it's a, a, a regular variable star, also red. A little bit of magnification, it's, it's again, it's quite a colourful area. Um, okay, M35, there's quite a few open clusters there. And we're, that's M35, and there's another one on, on the western edge, okay? That's on, on the sky for the month. So there's a little cluster in there also. Okay, that's the variable. And how it varies is on the sky for the month, without looking around too much. And um, it's got a little companion, okay? A little tiny companion, but it's 1.2 seconds in separation. So it's difficult, okay? But um, it just popped out with the computer software, my computer software. Okay? So there's a little companion. It's about magnitude, magnitude 9. Okay, last one, the Christmas tree cluster, and this is a doozy. This is, this is so easy. Um, and it's, it's just coincidental that I've ended up in the um, Gemini area. Uh, I'm going to do that one. Okay. Um, that star is Alhina of Gemini, 
That's the top left hand star of Gemini, very bright. And all you, can, all you have to do is whack over to that star there in your telescope finder and use the isosceles triangle to find the Christmas tree cluster. See how it's looking like a Christmas tree? That's a binocular view. That's 2264. It exists, okay? A um, couple of clusters above it. That is easy, okay? Very bright star. Another. Anyway, I've said that. And if we magnify it a bit further, we still re retain the rough idea of the Christmas tree. And why it's called the Christmas tree is because when we hit it with a telescope, it inverts. And we, when we see it, are going to see it like that. It's going to be inverted, okay? So don't get disappointed. It'll be upside down. Okay? So the Christmas tree cluster, appropriate for this time of the year. Okay, there's only two for the southern sky. Cepheid variable beta Doridos, which um, there's really not much to it. Okay, there's beta Doridos. I mean, that's, that's Doridos, that's the whole area of Doridos. It's on the sky for the month. And I think beta is that one there. And here comes some Star Wars. Wait for it. Okay, that's magnified. Doesn't really show much more. That's, that's the variable. Okay? Um, and I sort of left this hanging because it's got some good Star Wars things going. Pew! That's what you call a computer mistake. I know what I know what to do to eliminate it, but I thought it looked good if I left it there. And if we do a magnification with the telescope, we get it the other way. Pew! You want me to do it again? Pew! <laughs> that looks good. Pew! So, okay, just a bit of fun there. Don't say anything. Okay, last one from the southern sky. Um, it's a galaxy, and it's moderately um, easy. If you've got a computer telescope, sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm very bad. Okay, this is the, we all know Omega Centauri. This is the eastern edge of Centaurus, and this is rising slowly, and the galaxy is there, and um, moderate experience is needed for this, but I'll show it anyway. Um, whoops. Oh, I did that one. So there's the galaxy. Um, many of us are experienced observers would recognise those two blue stars, and it's sort of perpendicular to them. Um, that one's fainter, and we've still got um, Omega, Omega Centauri, so you've got your reference point. I mean, everyone knows where that is. Okay, so this is along again the eastern edge of Centaurus. Centaurus has to rise a bit to see this, but you know, January, December, January, it's a possibility. And if we hit it with a telescope, we see that. And that's not far from what it looks like. Um, not, not far, not, not bad. And I, I can spell spiral, but my type definition only is 20 letters, and that needs 22, so I lost the AL. Okay, that's a bit of... Okay, I'll leave it at that. Now, just a quick... Oops, I'll turn this off. One more. Okay. Opinion on some telescope stuff. Well, that's pretty well focused, isn't it? Now, yeah. <coughs> oh, a few people. Uh, I'm putting my two cents worth in here. I can be criticised. I don't care. A few people are beginning to buy computer telescopes. Us experienced observers, we've bought ones at a slightly higher price. And with the higher price, probably probably comes with it um, stability and good software and stuff like that. But there are some good telescopes coming at the lower range, and these are some examples. But be wary in the following way. Now, all of them are good, but they have some characteristics which you should be aware of. Now, basically it's centered around their focal ratios. That one there with a very long tube, therefore, has, that's, that's called an F10. That's 70 millimetres aperture. So is this one down here, 70. I'm trying to make a comparison with the focal ratios. 
The focal ratio is the, ra is the ratio of the mirror thing to the aperture. I'll leave, I'll, I'll leave that. Over, I've got three handouts which people who are wanting to buy a lower range computer telescope can take away if they want to. But my point is this. For telescopes which have computer control of the same apertures but different focal ratio, F10 there and F15 here, the software for this one must be accurate enough to show a smaller field using the same eyepieces. The software on this will show a greater field of view being F10 than the field of view here with F15. As the F number increases, the field of view decreases. One more example, and this probably explains it a bit better. The 91, which is F14, 13.8, as opposed to this one down here, which is F11. Same aperture, and unfortunately they're made by the same company, but it's a good company. That focal ratio 11 is less than the one up there 14. So using the same eyepieces in those telescopes, this will produce a slightly larger field of view than that one, Therefore, the, and the computer software will have a better chance of finding stuff on that telescope than on that. Now, this may be a sturdier telescope. Um, other factors come into it, but please be aware that when you buy a telescope, if you are, if you are very, a very inexperienced amateur, be aware that when you buy a, a high focal ratio telescope, you have got to have good software to handle the decreasing fields of view with the telescopes. I mean, the, these are excellent pseudo telescopes, but for general use, you may not see white, you, you will not see white clusters. Excuse me, Bob, can I just chuck in one or two blocks? Yes, one? yes. Uh, the only differences I can see with those is that you're, you're comparing a sweet cassette or whatever to a refractor. Yes, I, I'm, but, and, but the focal ratios do make a difference. Yeah, that's true. However, yes. if you're talking about accuracy, you're talking about the equatorial, do you have to find the south celestial pole of in night refractor? No, no, no. no. Is it just a two-star one? Yes, I have. For example, I'll give you, I'll give you this example. I need three. Yeah, for, forget, I forget the pilot. Yeah, forget the. I've tried to find the South Celestial. Yeah, pole. I'm not. I'm not, not talking about telescopes that have the need to find the pole. For me, the history. Okay. For, for my, I, I've, I'm not touching them. Now, I have this telescope. Now. It's a sort of baby telescope, okay? I showed this on the last telescope today. Now, here's another example. Now, that's a Mixido Cassegrain. That's a reflector, okay? Made different different companies. I am not touching telescopes that require polar alignment. Okay? Yeah, you never mentioned it. That's okay. Now, I'm, I'm simply making the point. This one has a focal ratio f8. That one, f13. The software on that will need to be good to bring a smaller fields of view with that telescope on the f15 than this one. Does anyone argue against that? It's true. And I'm simply saying, choose your telescope if you go down this path Choose a telescope that has a fair chance, it has decent software, it's got a good mount that can deliver views according to the focal ratio you've got. Okay? So, <coughs> they are the same in aperture, using the same eyepiece, the field on that will be less than that one there. Other factors come into consideration. 
I had bought that and the mount was the same great, so I've, I've changed it. But the software is good. I'm not sure of the software there, but you need to be aware of all these things. Well, okay, can I make a suggestion yes. that you put together some yes. of your yes. so I'll leave it with that. I, I, I just wanted to... And one more thing. If people put you under pressure, ignore the pressure. Take your time to decide on the telescope. It's not computer control. Take your time. Don't be pressured. Well, I would have thought you could always use a, a bigger uh, a, a, a focal length uh, eyepiece uh, if you've got trouble finding it or locating. I, I think that's an add-on correction to it, though. Choose your telescope wiser before you have to put the eyepiece in that fixes it. That, that's all I'm saying. Um, okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to have to Yes, agree. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, so we've got two more talks, uh, David, David please, and then uh, Ian Hopkins Hills with uh, the uh, Solar Eclipse. Um, <laughs> there was a sound spot there, there he was. <laughs> um, last, uh, last week we had the uh, scope day, which we've had earlier on a um, couple years back which was our first scope day and our last one was the other day and um, the day has now been officially called the Ken Bright Scope Day, obviously named after Ken Bright. We've had a few things donated to us in regards to working up at the Briars, but I thought I'd bring a few photos along showing you um, Scope Day. And there's uh, one of Bob's computer control telescopes, that's an ETX-125. And that's, um, that's Jane McConnell's, works very nicely. So it's getting there. And David Hubies, Alex 50, AU Spit Casabone, David Finding, the South Celestial Pulse, the Earth 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 one day. And Bob's Alex 90, he doesn't need to know where the South Celestial Pulse is for that one. And we were looking at the sun a little bit that day. And this was Alex's uh, telescope. I'm sorry about the little bit of reflection there. That's Alex's telescope. We were using. Um, he was using a solar filter, beta filter, I think it was, I was like, beta filter, yeah, beta filter, that's right. And, uh, yeah, that was working quite well. And there's Sally's little ETX-90, and we're using Greg Walton's um, uh, sun filter there, and there's Bob telling everyone that the focal ratio is not right and won't work. No, so, I didn't mean that, though. <laughs> Um, it, it, was, uh, it was giving us a nice view, so you can see the little the ETX 125 in the background, you can see a slightly larger telescope. And I called um, Richard Pollard, having a look through the ETX 125, and I said, what are you doing there? And as he looked up, I took a photo I think he was trying to steal it or something, that's my phone. And that's my new one which is a go-to telescope as well, but, and that does require to line up to the South Celestial Pole, but it's, uh, all I need is a compass, and it lines up quite nicely, and it finds things uh, fairly well, and I've got a lot of solar filter you can see at the front of that, and if anyone's interested in uh, looking at the um, eclipse coming up, we'll be somewhere losing that, and by the way, while I'm on the subject of uh, solar eclipses, etc., those who aren't going to Sejuna, and we're thinking of going to sea winds, as mentioned in what's on. Sea wind is no longer on. Uh, we can't go to sea winds. So um, at this stage, the, we haven't planned anything because we only sort of had this sort of a uh, um, decision was made tonight, this afternoon, in regards to sea winds. So what's on is wrong. So sea winds is not on. Um, but those who are on East Scorpius, we might come up with something um, in the meantime. Um, you should be able to see the eclipse in the rise. I think uh, the sun will be up high enough to see at least um, a fair bit of it that we can see from Melbourne anyway. So we might be just going to the Bryce. But uh, we'll have put a message on East Scorpius for that. Whoever is on East Scorpius, I'm sorry. We didn't have uh, time for that one. And I think it's you are a, a front image of what the solar field looks like on the front band. And by the way, um, that telescope's been modified slightly, but where it's been modified basically is in the tripod. And uh, they did come with a fairly flimsy tripod, but Peter Densley down the front here built that one for me because he, he's got one on his. And if we move over, there's uh, Peter Densley's scope there with his tripod. I was quite impressed with his tripod and decided to put one on mine. And if anyone would like to 
that's got one of these more flimsier tripods like this one um, and would like one of those um, heavier tripods, I'm sure Peter at the right price will build you one. <laughs> so give him a ring. Um, so that was Scope Day for this year. Um, telescope Learning Days have been successful as well this year and I've shown a few photos throughout the year of that. And uh, it's been a very good year in regards to Briars and observing. We've had more people at the Briars observing this year than I think any other year. So I hope next year we continue in that vein. I've got to mention one more thing, Peter, in regards to supposedly being new president, that the next committee meeting will be at the Briars next Wednesday at starting at 8 o'clock up at the Briars um, Shed. All right, for those new committee members. Thank you, and I'll hand you over to uh, Peter. While Ian's getting set up, I'll point out that there's no uh, meeting next month in December. The next meeting is in January. Just out of interest, if there ever were a December meeting, uh, who would actually uh, be willing to attend it at some stage in the future? Virtually everyone. Okay. Another, another quick poll. Who's actually going to go somewhere for the solar eclipse? I was, going to make, yes, I was going to ask that question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what, what's about half a dozen people? Is that half a dozen? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, where are you actually going? Yeah. Parkville Downs. Hmm? Parkville Downs. Up there near uh, Jeff Walmart. Jeff Jeff Walmart. Jeff 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 Who else is going? Jeff. Where are you going? Parkville Downs. Again? Yeah. Anybody going to St. Una? Yeah. I am. Peter is. That's about it, looks like. Yeah. And a few people are going to in the Woomera area, that is their area. Yeah. All right. There may be somebody who's not here now, but, but there is going, so there's a few people. So I'll have some stories to tell, and maybe somebody will come back with something. Uh, I've got this uh, article about eclipses. It was way back in the 70s, but it's got a little piece there about the hazards of the sun. I'll just read it to you, and then just talk about it briefly. <coughs> Solar eclipses are one of nature's most fascinating events and also one of the most dangerous for observers, as more and more of the solar disk is blotted out. The sun darkens and it becomes easier to gaze directly at the sun. While the visible light lessens, however, the pupils of the viewer's eyes dilate, allowing infrared radiation from the still uncovered crescent of the sun to focus on his retinas. Although he feels no pain, the infrared can quickly burn his retinas, causing irreparable damage to his <coughs> To avoid eye injury, medical authorities suggest that observers who look directly at an eclipse should do so only through at least two fully exposed photographic negatives that they have been developed to the maximum density. Sunglasses, welder's goggles or smoke glass do not provide adequate protection. To be completely safe, the eclipse watchers should turn his back to the sun and hold up a card with a pinhole. The sun's rays will be focused by the hole and projected as a sharp, safe solar image on any white surface a short distance away. Now, does anybody disagree with any of that? <coughs> yes? So, so you, um, Mr. Mr. President, new president, old president, can I, can I say two words? I was uh, uh, chairman of the Solar Eclipse Committee in Papua New Guinea in 83 and 84, yeah. so uh, <coughs> I've been through this uh, problem. Yeah. Um, the exposed film, that is an old article that refers to black and white film. Uh, yeah. <coughs> color film is, uh, uh, should be, uh, doesn't do the same thing. Yes. Um, and also, um, <coughs> can I remind the old observers amongst you that uh, um, if you have a normal biro <coughs> in your pocket and any sort of piece of paper and punch a hole with the tip, just the tip of the biro, like this, <coughs> that makes a perfectly good uh, pinhole, <coughs> uh, try it out for yourself. The problem is um, people don't like the pinhole projection system because on a normal day all you get is a round picture which is very boring and people say it doesn't work. However, on the day of an eclipse, a small hole punched to the tip of a barrel makes you a beautiful image of uh, the sun as uh, Ian mentioned on any, any white surface, any wall for that. So uh, <coughs> in Papua New Guinea we uh, promoted the use of uh, pinholes and tips of barrows and it yeah. uh, worked uh, two years ago. And there's enough barrows around in Papua New Guinea. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I disagree yeah. with the two negatives. Yeah, yeah, well that's right. These are the sorts of things that you read about and the whole problem is announcements have to be made by people who are not technical. Very often journalists, uh, instant experts, come up with all these sorts of crazy things but they also of course have to take into account the wider public who don't have access to the technical information that you people all have and 
Also, they're dealing with situations with people at various locations, so they can't give times. They can't say, after 9.21, it's perfectly safe. From 9.21 to 9.23, it's, it's perfectly safe. It depends on where you are. And, of course, they can't deal with... They can't deal with so many people in different or wide areas. So be, what they do, of course, is they play safe, you know, and say, and, and it's very hard to do, just to get the message across to a, an entire populace that during totality, whatever the eclipse, it's perfectly safe to look. Sure. So, so that's the uh, sort of situation. Is anybody else? There? There's another matter there about welding, welding filter. A welding filter. Um, it's 14, isn't it, Alfred? Are 14? I think yeah, I've, got, I've, got a, I've got a welding filter at home that's perfectly safe. That's not correct. But the thing is, I suppose they're playing safe that there must be some welding filters that are not. And, of course, they're saying here, well, making a blanket rule. There's welding filters for, for gas, gas welding. Yeah. And those are not good. Yeah. They're for arc welding. Yeah. That's the... 13 and 14. 14 is very hard to get out tried. Yeah. All the CIG places in the south of the city. Yeah. No one had, they all had to get a cut off, but no one had anything to shop. No one had, I see. So it's pretty hard to buy. Pretty hard to buy. Well, they're replacing for the miles. Yeah, that's right. It's a rectangular piece that's a. Uh, 14, yeah. I just could not find it. Yeah. So you'd have trouble buying a, a welding filter. But anyway, we've got these, these special glasses. But bear that in mind, if people ask you and so forth. The idea of the photographic negative, well, it has to be black and white film, not, not colour film. Yeah. It has to be really fully exposed, yeah. really fully developed. Yeah, interesting to read about uh, Captain Cook and the transit of Venus and had to observe the sun, he, him, he, him, and uh, felt, uh, the astronomer of the expedition, Green, and both of them, they did most of the observing. And of course, they, for a transit, of course, you preserve the sun for a lot longer than most eclipses. Um, I'll say it depends on the, I suppose if your partial phases are quite long. However, the, the transit was a matter of a number of hours. Uh, nothing was said exactly what they used, so as far as the filter is concerned. But smoke glass is about the only thing they would have had at their disposal. And yet they didn't actually say that. It doesn't say that in the reports. You can't find anything about what they did actually use to protect their eyes. And apparently, Captain Cook didn't die blind. He must have survived. So uh, apparently, uh, in history, we do know Galileo had his eyes very badly hurt by by observing the uh, observing the sun. So we know these sorts of things. We've got the special glasses. And bear in mind that really the only danger of the eclipse is it, to observe is at that last that last ten percent. And the eclipse that we're coming up now in Melbourne will only be it'll be less than seventy five percent. Uh, if it gets up to 90%, it's that last, that's the last 10 minutes before totality and the first 10 minutes after totality, they are the danger times because you can look without discomfort and your eye doesn't, you don't look away. When there's any more sun than that, of course, there's enough light there for you to, you just don't, you don't even look. So that's the only danger time. Uh, well, he did, he lived to a fair age. It was, Many years after that, uh, he lived ten years after the after the transit. Yeah. Oh, I think that's. Uh, is there any other queries about the about the about the viewing? We've got the glasses there to preserve and project the pinhole. That's an obvious way to do it. And of course, you're supposed to have it back to the sun while you look. Um, but uh, that's about all. by looking directly. You wouldn't look directly at the sun for less than seventy-five percent because it's you you wouldn't. Uh, you wouldn't really see the shape of the sun by try, even trying to look at it directly. You've got no idea to use the sun as well as watch it on television? Yeah, watch it on television is terrible though in this age that you, we have to do that. <laughs> we should be able to look at it directly again. Okay? Okay, thanks again. Uh, okay, well, I'll wrap up the meeting in a moment. Uh, the security guard pointed out that all the gates are closed except for the main one on Morella Drive, so on your way out, please go by the main gate if you um, normally try to cut, cut out around the back way. Uh, as a bit of a shortcut, you'll have to go out uh, through the main gates. Um, final reminder for the Astronomy 2003s and the glasses, uh, even if you don't have money here tonight and you'd like to reserve one, please let uh, Sally know and we'll put one aside for you for months and days. Okay, at that uh, I'll close November's meeting and we'll see you back here in January. Thank you.